Hey everyone, uh, I'm Martha and I am the Heritage Collection Manager and tonight we're going to talk about Genealogy 101 and this is um, part one of two. So you'll have to watch part two to um, go more in depth. And um, Genealogy 101 is kind of things that I've learned myself and what um, I apply because I tell a lot of people I do my genealogy without ancestry. Um, so we're just going to go over some ethics first, you know, um, be courte courteous, uh, respectful, um, give proper source citation. I'm horrible at um, this. Um, ask permission before publishing. Follow the rules of the institution you're visiting. Respect copyright law. Respect people's right to privacy. And share with others. Like, share your genealogy. You don't want to keep it all to yourself. You know, don't use pens around books or manuscripts. Um, don't write on top of books or documents, write in books. Um, I'm notorious for doing this. I've written myself into a ton of genealogy books just because I am the youngest by 12 years. And a lot of these genealogy books were written before I was born. So I always write myself in. Um, or I... I have this one, I have one that I write in and I have a clean copy. Um, don't dog your paper uh, pages. Don't use sticky notes. Those things are horrible getting out. Um, don't remove pages or pictures or documents from courthouses. Um, don't stack open books on top of each other while waiting for the photocopier because that's going to break the binding. Um, press. Don't press books on a photocopier to lie them flat. flat, flat. Uh, don't be long-winded when asking for information. Be right to the point. And um, don't sit on your research waiting for it to be complete because it's never going to be complete at all. Um, another great resource um, for genealogy standards and all that kind of do's and don'ts and um, all that kind of things is the geneal Genealogy Standards 2nd Edition book. And... Um, we have this at the library for you to peruse through. It's in our heritage collection or our local history collection, so it's not available for checkout, but you're more than welcome to sit at the library and read. So how do you start your family history? Um, you gather resources that you have in your home, ask your relatives for information, correspond with family and friends, uh, choose a filing method, either paper or computer. I do both. Um, if a computer, choose a computer program, I use my heritage because it's a lot easier and um, a lot less scary than Ancestry. Um, and um, designate a work area in your home, read how-to books and periodicals. We have those at the library that you can read. Attend classes, workshops, and seminars. If you don't know, we have Genealogy Club that um, meets every second Tuesday in, um, except for October, it's a little weird, um, at the library, and we talk about all things genealogy, we help each other when we're stumped, um, things like that. So that's something, and of course, watching Genealogy 101 is something also. Um, so research at libraries, courthouses, and health departments, research online, be careful gene of ancestry, uh, join genealogy societies, document everything, uh, visit the local area where your ancestor lived, collect and copy all photographs, documents, letters from your relatives, and share your research with others. Um, you want to survey and collect. You want to gather names, vital com uh, statistics, and other information. Uh, find out who's the family pack rat and bug them for um, documents and all that kind of stuff. Um, locate, rel um, you know, locating relatives and other contemporary individuals and um, start a document, a document organization system and keep irreplaceable items in a safe, dry space, uh, place. I have a um, picture of one of my relatives and their family um, or one of my ancestors and their family. I don't keep it with my genealogy stuff. It's not even photocopied. Um, so I keep it in a very, very safe space um, where no one can touch it. No one knows. I don't even think my husband knows um, that I have it, let alone where it is. Um, 
So yeah. So where do you start? Um, you gather information from family members and use standard forms. Um, construct a timeline for each person. Look at census records. Census records are going to be your bestest friends. Um, check vital records for each of your family. Find other records and document every piece of information that you get. Uh, the title of the book or record, author, date, page number, record number, physical location of the item. And if you feel like I'm repeating myself over and over and over, it's because all of this stuff is incredibly important. So talking with your relatives, you want to get the facts. You want to know who, what, when, and where. Um, vital statistics are the bare bones of genealogy. You want their full name, where, when they were born, where, names of parents, marriage, when, where, and to whom, um, and died, when, where, and where are they buried. Um, these are vitally important to your genealogy. So 10 common mistakes and how to avoid them, um, failing to document your uh, sources. I do that all the time. Um, relying on online data found in a family tree. Ancestry. And this is horrible at doing this um, because you can, you see those shaking leaves in your um, ancestry uh, tree and you think, oh, they have something. And then you attach the wrong record and that completely um, changes your whole research. Um, researching the wrong family, making sure that you have the correct family, jumping to conclusions based on insignificant evidence, assuming a family name is only spelled one way. Um, I have multiple ways to spell my family's names, and I search them all. Um, skipping a generation, assuming you're related to a famous person who shares the same last name, overlooking the maiden names of female ancestors. I know they are a there to research because you can never find a female um, in the 1700s, late 1800s. Um, but it is very, very important to search for those maiden names. Ignoring the siblings of the ancestors you are researching. Um, this can help you immensely, especially when tracking migration and um, just trying to find your ancestors period and failing to record information on standard genealogical forms. Um, like I said, I do both forms and computer, um, just because I like to have both. So, few, uh, cemetery and funeral records. Um, these are really important, and we'll get more into cemetery and funeral um, in part two, because um, those are, a cemetery is um, just full of information. It's a wealth of information. Um, like this quote says, a cemetery is like a book with so many stories. Um, you know, you have an interment card, which is an index listing the person's name and location of the grave. Um, it sometimes includes biographical information, such as a date, place, and um, birth and death, um, lot records, and maps. Um, these are often ledger forms listing where everyone is buried on a particular uh, lot. Sometimes uh, list relation to the lot owner, uh, the church graveyard. You can check with the church for death and burial records. Some great places to find these are um, find a grave. There's 180 million records on find a grave. Um, and what's really fun with find a grave is that um, sometimes you can find a parent because they're linked to their child's um, record or you can find an obituary, you can find pictures. Um, it's this great database that just has a wealth of information. Um, you have billion graves, internment.com, US Gen Web, uh, Cindy's List, and Ed and Ebby, or Ed and Debbie, um, which has local cemeteries. And there's a lot of cemeteries out there themselves that have their own um, websites. Now, um, the um, big cemetery, I forget what it's called in Indianapolis, um, they have their own um, obituary, they have their own website where you can search for um, graves and such. So funeral home records, um, these are full of information. Um, 
you know, you have the full name, the occupation, the maiden name, uh, the birth and death date, cause of death, the parents with the mother's maiden name. Um, and these often contain a copy of the death certificate, burial permit, text of the obituary, where they're buried or where the body was shipped, um, possibly a photo. Um, sometimes they have body preparation instructions, casket and vault uh, selections and invoices, burial clothing, clergy, pallbearers, um, who paid for the funeral, who made the arrangements, name and addresses, and telephone numbers of family and friends to contact on behalf of the family. Um, which I'm sure at the local cemeteries, they do have all of that. So newspaper research. Newspaper research is also your best friend. Um, so you can find, um, what can you find in there? You can find birth, marriage, divorce, death notices, photographs, social columns, major events. Um, I've actually found those for my own family um, where my great grandparents were at the same party celebrating a birthday. Uh, news news articles featuring your ancestors, employers and business articles, naturalization ceremonies, ship arrivals, and departures. Um, you can also find classified ads. We, um, one of my ancestors made windmills, so we actually have a classified ad of him selling his windmills, school events, historical columns, repairing an old Newspaper articles, arrests, and crime articles are also important. And in a little bit, I'm going to talk about a couple case studies with um, my own family and going through what I what I found. Um, obituaries. These are mini profile biological um, bi oh, sorry a biographical sketch of your family member um, and the early in the late 1800s uh late 1900s obituaries or early 1900s i'm sorry um obituaries were beautiful pieces and they um gave you a lot in a huge glimpse into the person's life um i've actually wrote programs on research from obituaries and um that's where i got them all it gives them more detail than death notices. Um, it has key information, um, like name, date of birth, date of death, age, location, cemetery, survivors, church affiliation, school, profession, occupation, membership, memberships, and it gives you clues to where to look next. So what can the census tell us? The census can actually tell us a lot. So um, this year is a census year, which um, it's kind of weird. They don't really ask you a lot of questions like they have in the past. Um, I'm a little disappointed in this, um, but this is a picture of a census taker. Census takers used to come to your homes and write down all of the information. So this is where you encounter names being spelt wrong, uh, people missing um, things like that, because the census takers always didn't find your home, or um, information could have been given by a child or a neighbor. Um, it just depends. Um, so, geneal uh, census records are the most popular records for genealogists and uh, family historians. They place individuals in a particular geographical location during a specific time period which um, in part two, I'll actually show you what um, I've done with migration patterns in my family. Um, they provide information regarding the individual living in a household, and they provide information on the individual's neighbors who might have been relatives. So censuses are available every 10 years from 1790 to 1940. Um, 1950 will be um, released in 2024, I want to say, um, and that's just because of privacy and copyright laws. Um, a little note about the 1890 census, it was, most of the census was destroyed as a result of the fire in 1920, as a result of a fire um, in 1921 but records did survive 
for Alabama, D.C., Georgia, Illinois, Ohio, Minnesota, New Jersey, New York, North Carolina, South Dakota, and Texas. Um, so if you have relatives from there, you can find um, your family's information in 1890. So like I said, common census problems. Um, this is what I talked about when we were looking at that photo with the census taker. Um, the spelling might not be correct or consistent. Um, uh, last name in my family history is Kramer. It appears in the census as Creamer. Um, they wrote what they thought they heard. Um, they would, if somebody other than a family member would sub supply the information, it would be different. Um, names can't be found or they can't be found in the index. Um, because the name was misspelled, um, my grandma's um, name was misspelled in the census, um, but it could have been misspelled in the indexing process or the indexer could have missed a name. Those census sheets are really, really hard to read. Um, you know, if they seem missed or they're missing from the census, um, they could have not seen the farm or house or dwelling um, they might not have known that there was people living in the particular area um, or no one was home at the time that the census taker came around. Um, so he failed to either ask or come back. Um, if, the, if the information is not correct, um, if you look at that and you know that your family member was this old during the census or they had this occupation or their mother was from, you know, Indiana and not Pennsylvania, um, it could be because the census taker obtained the information from a neighbor. Um, the individual might not have known the exact information of where their mother was from. Um, you know, the census taker could have guessed if the individuals didn't know or if they were unwilling to tell and children could have provided the information um, because the parents weren't available. So here's um, some areas that you'll find in um, the censuses. Um, so from the censuses in 1790 to 1840, they only named the head of family and the head count by age and gender. Um, so if you look at uh, 1790 census, it's going to have the head of household. Um, it will say males and it will have age groups. Um, and then it will say females and then it will have age groups. Um, so 1850 to 1870, they get more in depth. Like um, they name all the individuals, they have their ages, um, you know what? their color, their place of birth, um, the year that they were married, um, you know, their profession or occupation, if they attended school that year, if they could read or write, um, just different things like that. In the 1870 census, it had um, where the mother and father were born. So um, 1880 to 1900 get a lot uh, more in depth so you have the uh, number of years that you were married. The mother had how many children? And um, this helps you understand, like, if there were children in your family um, that you didn't know. So say um, the census said eight, that the mother had eight children, but um, there's only six living. There's also a space that said the number of living children. So you know that there's two children um, in there and they can help you fill in the gaps. Um, you know, it has naturalization status, year of migration to the U.S., the number of years in the U.S., um, just some great, like, um, how many weeks, months they were employed, um, the months that they attended school. So um, this is really, really great to um, help you along with your genealogy. So 1910 to 1920, um, they added Civil War veterans, um, the year of naturalization, the native language of the parents, um, you know, just 
great things like that. Uh, 1930, 1940, um, you know, they have monthly rental if renting the value of their home, um, their residence five years earlier, um, the highest grade att attained in um, school, you know, if they're a public emergency worker, uh, military, which war, all that kind of stuff. So, um, Along with the census, we want to look at vital records. So um, this includes, you know, birth records, and um, those can be obtained from the health department along with death, re death records. Also, um, for birth records, you have to be a birth relative, and you can say that it's for genealogical um, use. Death records can be obtained as a certified record for legal or genealogical use. Uh, marriage records and divorce records are also available through the county clerk's office. So church records are kept locally. And um, so they may be, or they may be sent to a centralized archives or uh, church body headquarters. Births were initially registered with churches who maintained a register of births. So, um, I do know in um, Pennsylvania, they didn't start creating birth uh, certificates until 1910. So for my great grandma, we had to go to a church and get her um, register of birth. Um, they also kept baptismal records and early ma uh, marriage dis uh, dissolutions. So some Indiana church repositories, um, you know, Franklin College is one, DePaul University, um, I didn't change this, but, um, the Mennonite ones are no longer, um, kept at Goshen College. They are kept at the seminary in Elkhart. Uh, missionary is at Bethel University. Presbyterian is at Hanover College. Um, Disciple of the Christ is actually in Nashville, Tennessee. Um, the Catholic is handled at the University of Notre Dame. Quaker is at Earlham. College, um, French Catholic is at Vincennes. So military records. Um, the types of records that are available are service records, uh, bounty land records, pension records, um, and private claims by citizens for services performed or losses incurred. Um, these can be found at the National Archives. Um, the Great Lakes District Archives in Chicago also. Um, the National Archives, you would go through St. Louis. That's the branch that keeps a lot of the service records. They did have a fire, so um, some service records are missing. Uh, you can go to state archives, which have colonial records, state troops, and uh, militia records. County courthouses have militia rules, muster lists, uh, discharge papers, and et cetera. So, we're going to talk um, about some stuff um, that I, I deal, I, I take a lot of um, emails and letters from people, and we're going to talk about ancestry timelines also, and then I'll get into some case studies about my family. So, um, when requesting information, make sure that you say where you're from. Um, in some cases, who you are, why you are researching. Um, include names, dates, maiden names, spelling variations, and possible locations of your ancestors, and expect to wait. Um, we always tell people that if you haven't heard from us in a month, um, just give us a call or shoot us an email, see what we're doing. Um, so this is a um, email that I wrote just saying, um, it was to the uh, Evangelical Lutheran Association archives at uh, Gettysburg Seminary. And I was looking for some marriage records. Um, and I stated what church they went to, where the church was. Um, you know, I gave um, variations of the last name. I gave their years, um, the maiden names, different things like that. And then I said that I was lo looking for birth records also um, for these people. 
Um, so this was our response. I had to go through the Church of uh, Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints um, because some of those records are on microfilm and um, are provided by um, the um, Church of Latter-day Saints because of their collection is not open for research because of the fragile condition. Um, so I thought that was really, really cool. He also told me to look on Ancestry.com. Um, uh, and then he also said um, he gave me the um, church address, which I never did write them a letter or contact them um, because it just fell off my radar. Um, here's another one that um, I can't remember where I sent this to, but I just said like, hey, here are some, here's some stuff that I'm looking for, and um, I was hoping that you could help me. Um, they emailed me back saying that they had one of their ladies working on their request, um, and so they didn't find anything in that volume that I had talked, that I had mentioned in my email. They're looking for other, uh, other places for me. This was the last communication that I got from them. Um, this is a letter that I wrote to a family member, um, just because I had a lot of questions um, when they wrote our um, family history book. You know, um, I, I stated who I was, um, who my mom was, who my grandma was, um, and you know, I was, I was interested in knowing where she got all this information, like, um, my great grandma's dad's name, because he, as far as we knew that, she was an Ill illegitimate child, so it was crazy to read her family history and see his name there, um, you know, um, then I found some really sketchy stuff, which I'll talk about in a little bit, because I found the answer on my own, and I, I just wanted to know if she knew the answer. Um, this is an email that I've gotten myself for a person um, looking for information. She had actually talked on the phone to me, and so she, um, she was just introducing herself. She sent me PDFs of her work, and um, this was a writer, and I worked with her for six months. Um, this was another email. It got long-winded, and um, so it kind of it kind of got crazy. And she just wanted to know if she could rely on us for information for her book. Um, which is kind of crazy, and I never, I never heard if she had gotten her book published or not. Um, this is another um, email that I got that um, they just wanted a couple, a couple questions answered that they had and um, whatnot. Um, so yeah, they they pretty much focus on um, that, giving us focused questions. Um, this one, I, um, Linda from Michigan, she's really, really cool. She would actually, um, she found a website that we had um, disconnected from and she would email me what she would find on that website. So then I could get her, her obituaries, which um, I did this quite a few times for her. So I know we already talked about research mistakes and how to avoid them and what to do when you get stuck, but we're just going to go over them again because um, you don't want to mistake stuff. So 10 common mistakes. Um, we already talked about this, you know, failing to document your sources, um, overlooking maiden names of female at ancestors, um, assuming that you're related to famous people who have the same last name. Um, I, I can tell you on um, my side of the family, um, I'm related to Hershey's and I'm related to Carter's. I am not related to Jimmy Carter. 
but I am related to Milton Hershey, the creator of Hershey's Chocolate Factory. On my husband's side, he has um, Tiffany's and Bacon's. Um, he is not related to Kevin Bacon, um, thankfully because Kevin Bacon's genealogy is all public online, but he is related to um, Charles Tiffany, the creator of Tiffany and Company. Um, so we always joke that um, we have jewelry and chocolate in our family, um, but that took a lot of research for us. And um, coincidentally, going to Allen County Public Library in Fort Wayne, uh, where the Genealogy Center is. It's the second largest um, genealogy repository in the United States um, next to the Latter-day Saints. And um, there we are able to connect all the dots um, to our families. So what do you do when you get stuck? Uh, focus on siblings and their families, study the area's local history, read the private papers of local residents, uh, look forward in time rather than backwards, uh, read the local newspaper, uh, investigate witnesses and neighbors, interview your relatives again, and study historical maps. Because um, what's going to happen is um, over time, those townships and those county lines, they've morphed and moved and all sorts of stuff like that. So um, I said that we're going to look at um, ancestry timelines and things like that. So um, I'm going to do a couple um, case studies involving my own family. So um, this is my great great grandmother, uh, Lydia Margaret or Maggie. Um, I was always told that her name was Margaret Kelly or Maggie Kelly. Um, I found her in the 1910 census as Margaret Kiefer. Um, and then I found her because I found who she was. Um, and I only found her because my great grandma was attached, was um, in her son, was with her in the census saying that she was the head of household stepdaughter. Um, then I found her in Mr. Kiefer, Kiefer's obituary as Mrs. Maggie M. Kramer. Um, and you're probably like, how did you find her as Lydia? Well, I was going through a family history book and I found her picture with her name. And I was like, what the heck? Um, it's just really, really crazy. Um, so then I found her as Lydia Margaret Kramer on findagrave.com. So, um, ancestry timelines. Um, and I will tell you that I found her um, as Lydia Mar Margaret Kramer um, at 2 a.m. when I was doing a lot of research. Um, I may have screamed. Luckily, my husband was still awake, so it wasn't uh, too earth shattering for him, but I was so excited that I actually found her. Um, so ancestry timelines, they help you put together the pieces into your family tree, um, and so you know where they were living and what they were possibly doing. So um, with Lydia, I found, um, from there, I found when she was born. She was born to William and Mary Kramer. Um, you know, she lived in Lugerin, Franklin, uh, Pennsylvania. That's where she was born. Um, I do know um, she had a baby girl named Abigail, or Abby Mae Kelly, in um, March 28, 1899. Um, I know that she was serving as a servant to uh, the Wingert family in Letter Cutty, Franklin, Pennsylvania in 1900. I know when her mother passed away, uh, she married a widower, Jacob Kiefer, in 1907. In 1910, she was uh, living in Lugerne, Franklin, Pennsylvania. Um, her father, William, who's the community drunk, who we'll get to him in a little bit, um, passed away. He, when her um, daughter married my great-grandfather, uh, when her first grandchild was born, and then when she was, uh, and then when she died. Uh, she suffered from tuberculosis most of her life. <coughs> um, so she passed away relatively young at 36, but um, it's found that a lot of her family had um, suffered from tuberculosis because of their living situations. 
So, um, watch out for skeletons and other things that you may not have expected to find out about your family. So be prepared to find those skeletons in your family's closets. Um, if you think your family is normal, you probably aren't a genealogist. Uh, so this is William Joseph Kramer. In the 1900 census, I actually found him listed as a pr prisoner in a Philadelphia prison. Um, in talking to with family members and um, kind of not coming out and saying it, but in a roundabout way, they were unaware of where he was. Um, you know, one family member gives the account that he chased off my great grandma's real dad. Um, but what's the true, true story? Um, so I um, made a timeline for him. I knew that he was born. Um, I shared a birthday with him on March 6, 1852, um, to Peter and Elizabeth. Um, in 1860, they were living, still living in Letterkenny uh, Township, Franklin, or Franklin County, Pennsylvania. Um, a census claims that Elizabeth and uh, Peter and Elizabeth were married in 1860, but they would have had four children before they were born. So that's another huge mystery um, in my family tree. In 1870, I know that William was working on his parents' farm. Um, in 1876, his son James um, is born. Between 1877 and 1878, he marries my great-great-great-grandma. Um, and so between 1878 and 1895, um, they have nine more kids. Um, so they have Mary Lydia Margaret, who is my great great grandma, uh, Myrtle, Edward, Alfred, Hector, Susan, Sarah, and Nellie. Um, in 1881, he appeared in the Shippensburg uh, News to have been found uh, guilty of selling liquor without a license and was sentenced to pay a fine of $500, uh, the cost of prosecution and imprisonment in jail for three months. Um, so that happened in December. In February, there was 52 acres of land um, that was sold to his wife for $1,200. Um, this property may have been sold because he was in jail. Um, in June of 1897, he is arrested for threatening to shoot his wife um, and threats alarmed her so much that when he went to get his gun, um, that he, um, that she escaped through a window, and it said that he had been in trouble before. Um, in July then of 1897, he was arrested on the charge of assault and battery with the intent to commit a rape on his 14-year-old daughter. This would have been his daughter, Myrtle, um, and this happened one week after he threatened to shoot his wife. Um, so this is from September 1897, um, when he was sentenced. Um, he didn't receive his sentence as expected, but he became a fugitive. So after they came with their verdict, he clapped his hat on the side of his head and he walked out of the, out of the door. Um, he went home, he loaded up some wheat on his wagon, he told his family goodbye, he drove to the mill and he sold his grain, and then he went to another city and took a train from there. Um, and so um, his whereabouts were unknown for a couple of months. Um, other articles say that his father had to forfeit his bail, but um, two months later he came back um, and he surrendered himself to the sheriff and he had been as far away as Burlington, Iowa. Um, he was sentenced to four years and 11 months in a penitentiary for a serious crime. The extreme penalty was five years. So he, they didn't give him five years. They just gave him um, almost five years. Um, so I found him in the Eastern State Penitentiary in Philadelphia and he was um, given an early release on July of 1901. But I also found his prison record. So according to his prison record, and it told me a lot, and I learned a lot about him, 
He was a carpenter. He was 45 years old. He had dark complexion, gray eyes, brown hair, and he was also bald. Uh, he was 5'8". He wore 10 and a half size shoes. Um, I know when he was sentenced and when he was received at the penitentiary, and he also had to pay a $100 fine. Um, while he was in prison, my great-grandmother was born in 1899, um, and his father died in 1900, um, but his wife and children continued to live um, in Luger and Franklin County. In 1904, his wife passed away. Um, his mother passed away in 1908, and in 1910, he was living in Mechanicsburg, Cumberland County, Pennsylvania. Um, we do know that he passed away on July 21st, 1915. Um, and this is a newspaper article um, that he died alone in a hut. Um, and it kind of talks about how um, he was community drunk and, um, you know, he had lived there for some time and um, he had lived there for about nine months. Um, he lived alone. He didn't like his neighbors. They said that he was 55, which he actually died in his 60s. Um, but his death certificate is kind of alarming. Um, they think it was heart failure. Um, you know, the doctor that came, he says that he didn't. Um, he saw the man after he was dead um, and just different little things like that, not knowing where he was, his date of birth, um, his birthplace, his parents, things like that are not on his death certificate. Uh, so how did I figure this all out? Um, a family history sparked my interest. Um, census records on familysearch.org, um, ancestry.com and newspapers.com. I use a lot of free trials um, and I do a ton of research in those free weeks. <coughs> um, Bundegrave.com, um, just asking family members, and even though none of them claimed to know this. So how are you going to figure out your ancestor? Um, I put in a lot of time. Um, I probably uh, researched William for months just because I wanted to know him. Um, and I definitely got to know him. Uh, so one thing that we're we're going to talk about, um, lastly, I have a couple last things, um, you know, so death certificates and what they may have wrong. Um, so this is, um, my great, my fourth great grandma, um, Elizabeth Skelly Creamer. Um, it has her birthplace, that she was a widow, um, what she died from. She had heart disease, um, she, who her mother was, who her father was, um, her occupation, where she's buried, um, all of that is correct. Um, you just saw this with William, um, and yeah, like none of this, his, his date of death is correct. Um, I can't even find him where it says where his place of burial is, um, and different things like that, so. Yeah, it says I was about 55 years old. I think he was about, I think he was 62 when he passed away. Um, maybe 63 or 64, something like that. Um, so yeah, kind of, kind of crazy. So you have to watch those death certificates. Um, so don't be a copy and paste genealogist. Um, so this actually is um, a record of um William Kramers and you know it says that he um was born in 1875 his death was before March of 1923 there's really nothing here that supports those theories um and then I had a friend who said um this found out on ancestry.com that my ancestors are British nobility um, and then it goes all well documented, um, and my, um, like the shaking little leaves in the ancestry, my, um, genealogy shaking, uh, sense went off, 
um, because you can never trust um, well-documented things. You need to do that research yourself. Um, so this is actually Ancestry's uh, terms and of services, and they actually have a liability disclaimer um, saying that, you know, they do not take responsibility of the use. Um, they do not guarantee um, adequacy. Um, you know, they don't do the research themselves. They are just the vessel that um, houses the records. Um, you know, and I, I told him, I was like, hey, you know, um, <laughs> I think it would be good to ver verify with a genealogist. Um, I know that, you know, um, for me that it's certain, um, but when I hit, um, actually, no, this was his, um, or no, this was mine, I'm sorry, um, you know, if I hit nobility and it's on my dad's side because that's mostly Amish and Mennonite, um, I'm like, whoa, wait a minute. Um, so, you know, um, I just say, you know, um, just get the full scoop. So thank you guys so much for joining me for Genealogy 101 Part 1. Um, the next Genealogy 101, we're going to go into um, one of my favorite top si topics that's becoming uh, fast and furious is forensic genealogy. Um, we'll talk about cemeteries, um, how to, um, you know, plan a trip to the cemetery and what to do there, DNA testing, um, Google Maps and migration. I've learned, um, did you know that you can create a Google Map and like put pins in and um, have this whole cool thing of mapping your family's migration? Um, so, see you next time. Thanks for watching.